And now I'd like to introduce the EDTA Board Vice President, Debbie Corbin. Good morning. It's a great honor to introduce our opening keynote speaker, Ken Davenport. Ken is a Tony Award-winning Broadway producer who has produced over a dozen Broadway shows, including Deaf West Theater's Spring Awakening, The Visit, Kinky Boots, Macbeth, and Godspell, as well as six off-Broadway shows, including Altar Boys, The Awesome 80s Prom, and Daddy Long Legs. Ken created the best-selling Broadway board game, Be a Broadway Star, and he runs several theatrical websites, including the very popular DidHeLikeIt.com and his widely read blog, TheProducersPerspective.com, which has been featured in Forbes, The Gothamist, and more. His unique marketing style has been featured in two front-page New York Times articles, on the homepage of CNN, on the must list of Entertainment Weekly, and in many more national and international media outlets. His upcoming projects, the new musical Getting the Band Back Together, and revivals of The Great White Hope and Once on This Island. And yes, that was him in one of the very first iPhone commercials. Please welcome Ken Davenport. Good morning, everybody. I love it. Keynote in Vegas at 9 a.m. It's the best time. I feel like we should take a little poll about who was out the latest last night. 1 a.m., anyone past 1? 2? Anyone 2? 3? 3 a.m., any 4s? Four, five, eight, all night. Oh, you got up at four. Teachers. <laughs> I do love, by the way, that you guys have two conferences a year, and the one where you take all the kids is in Lincoln, Nebraska, and where all the adults is in Vegas, so. <laughs> way to go, way to go. Uh, I do want to thank you all for having me here today. Uh, it means a lot. Um, it, it's quite an honor to be, uh, to be here. I know the Tropicana wants to also thank you for having me today based on the number of deposits I made last night at the, at the blackjack table. Uh, you all have uh, heard the phrase, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. They are talking about your money, so just remember that when you uh, are out tonight. Um, the funny thing about gambling is that we, we know the odds are against us, right? We do it anyway, no matter how risky it is, no matter how hard it is to make a buck. Sounds like the arts. Sounds like what we all do for a living. If only we could get more people to gamble on the arts as they do out there in those blackjack tables. I wanted to take you through today, when I was thinking about putting together this keynote, my path and how really I decide the things that I want to do and how I think it plays into your theme here today. So I, I started in the theater when I was five years old and my parents dragged me to an audition for the local community theater production of The Steadfast Tin Soldier. That's me, the, the tall blonde kid in the back. No, no, no. Uh, that's me down front with a very serious looking face. I don't, <laughs> I don't know what that was about. Um, not coincidentally, my parents were actually divorced when I was five years old. And the reason why I say not coincidentally is because I think actually the theater was the one place where they could both get along. And actually, I believe that's a me my metaphor for the theater itself. It's, it's this one place where literally thousands of people can come under one roof and be united with one message. No matter what sex, race, religion, sexuality, they hear one unified message from the authors and the artists on stage, right? And it's one of the most beautiful things ever. If only we could get this group to be unified <laughs> like a theatrical audience. Talk about a group of people who need to see a musical. A, a quick side story about that is I actually, when I was doing Godspell on Broadway, I, uh, Stephen Schwartz, when I asked him what uh, Godspell was about, I said, explain it to me. It's kind of how I designed my marketing plans. He said, Godspell is about a community of people coming together. And I thought, well, one of the things I could do, this community was literally not coming together. I should invite them all to see the show. So I did. We sent letters to every single member of Congress inviting them to see Godspell on me. The interesting thing was I got a whole bunch of responses from Democrats saying, I'm so sorry, we, we would love to come, but we can't accept gifts from you on this behalf. And then I got a whole bunch of responses from Republicans who said, we'll take the tickets, let me know when we want to show up. So I did theater from the age of five until I was about 12 years old, uh, and when I got too cool for it. 
uh, and that's when I decided I got into sports a little bit, of course. I'm from a small town in Massachusetts. Anyone else? Any Massachusetts folks here? Um, I thought I was, uh, at that point in my life, I thought I was going to play for the Boston Red Sox and the Boston Celtics simultaneously. I was going to be that kid. Disney was going to make movies about me. It was going to be fantastic. Um, I did like sports, but to be very honest, and it's something I can realize now, the real reason I got into sports was because it's what all my other friends were doing. I literally can remember the day I was in my sandbox and my best friend, Joey V, came down and said to me, hey, my dad just got me early admission to Little League because his birthday fell on a weird day. And I was like, Little League, I don't really know what that is, but if he's doing it, I should do it too. And that's what got me into sports. And you know, at that age, and especially at any young age, all the students that you teach, um, I just wanted to fit in. That's all that I wanted to do. So I pursued my hoop dreams until about my senior year of college, um, when my life changed a bit and I got rebit by the theater bug when I saw Les Mis. Now I'm part of years old, and I call myself part of the Les Mis generation. There's a whole group of us out there actually, in working in New York now and around the country that are in their 30s and 40s, I'm 44 years old, that are actually in the business because of Les Mis, right? Any Les Mis fans out there? Any, yes, fantastic. Sing along tonight, 11th floor hallway, yeah? I get to be Javert though, okay? So that's the deal. There's no negotiation, none. Okay, I gotta get, I gotta get rid of that slide quick. Um, before I saw Les Mis, I didn't realize that theater could do that. For me, theater was Annie and Anything Goes and wonderful shows, but fluffy, light entertainment. And when I saw Les Mis, I just was so moved by it. And I remember thinking, I wanna do things that move people like that. And I became obsessed, right? I listened to it nonstop. And I'm sure there are many of you in the audience that know exactly what I'm talking about. At home, of course, on vacation. My favorite, I used to crank the complete symphonic recording on my 35 mile uh, drive to school every morning. And here of course was the interesting part as I got closer to the parking lot, I would switch it out for something like MC Hammer's You Can't Touch This, right? Because this was cool. <laughs> and I wanted to be cool and I just didn't know a lot of my friends, if I didn't think they would think I was cool if I listened to musical theater. I wanted to fit in. Right? And my musical theater love or the growing affinity for it just wasn't cool at the time. Hammer pants were cool. Uh, so I started to get, a, something was stirring obviously inside me and I took an acting class because it was an arts requirement. I thought it would be an easy grade, right? And then, now I was still a jock at this time. And then something, another life-changing event happened. And I swear to you in a scene like right out of high school musical, I quit the basketball team. And I'm not kidding you. Like, I couldn't have staged this any better. I was, it was in the middle of a practice one day. I got hit in a place where guys don't like to get hit by a ball. My coach said to me, get back on the court. And I said, just give me a minute. He said, you're such a wimp. And I was like, you know what? I quit and I'm gonna do the musical. <laughs> I walked off the court. <laughs> I'm telling you that is exactly what happened. Yeah, I was uh, destined for a dramatic career for sure. Uh, so I did quit. I played Billy Crocker in Anything Goes. I will spare you those photos for sure. Um, but still, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. At this point in my life, I was going to be a lawyer. Now, the reason I wanted to be a lawyer is because, yes, I was obsessed with L.A. law. I mean, who didn't want to be Arnie Becker? I mean, look at that hair and that, that face. Uh, he drove a Porsche. Uh, so I wanted to be a lawyer and the other reason of course I wanted to be a lawyer is because I went to a very small college prep school in Central Mass called Bancroft wonderful school I loved it, but that's what it did. It churned out doctors and lawyers and of course I looked around and that's what everyone else was doing and I Wanted to fit in So I went to Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. Yes Baltimore is in the house Yes, Blue Jays. No, I transferred actually after about a year. <laughs> I went to Tisch at NYU, sorry. <laughs> I still don't understand lacrosse. I don't quite get it, so. Um, <laughs> you set yourself up for that one so big, uh, sorry. 
Um, actually, I did. Um, let's just go back to Hopkins for a second. <laughs> Give Baltimore a little credit. Uh, for those of you who know Baltimore in the 90s, there was this massive dinner theater circuit in, in the 90s. And I ended up spending a lot more. Toby's? Did you say Toby? Toby's is like the best. I dreamed about working at Toby's. Um, I worked at Harbor Lights. We put it out of business. Um, uh, but I ended up doing more theater there than uh, even going to class. Um, so that's when I told my parents that I wanted to be an actor and I wanted to pursue theater. And dad, who was an Indian doctor, actually, was like, go for it. Um, my mom was like, I'm not so sure. Um, but I did transfer like right away. I went to Tisch School of the Arts. And I remember choosing Tisch and, and New York specifically because I remember saying, I'm going to go to New York because this is where Broadway happens. And I'll meet someone that will segue me into the business. And that is exactly what happened. It's like a chapter out of The Secret or something. I, I met Jack Lee, a uh, famed Broadway music director who unfortunately just passed away a few months ago. Uh, and he recommended me for a production assistant position on My Fair Lady, starring Richard Chamberlain in 1993. Now, when he said, Ken, I want you to be a production assistant, I really had no idea what that meant. Come to find out, it means walking dogs in a blizzard, getting Richard Chamberlain his fresh roasted turkey sandwiches cut off the bone, had to be fresh. I was like me running around Chelsea trying, do you have fresh roasted? No, do you have fresh roasted? It meant doing all of those things, driving the cast members to fast food in Florida when we were on tech. Uh, and I loved every second of it. And you know, I speak to a lot of young people today about uh, their careers and how to choose what they want to do. And so many of them, you know, are like, I don't know what I want to do. I don't know what I want to do. Uh, and I always say to them, look, at, at a young age, you're going to get offered a lot of opportunities. And for a while, unlike Nancy Reagan's cliche from the 80s, just say no, what you should do is just say yes. I mean, this is what I tell people to do, especially when you're young, because you don't have the responsibilities. I often tell them, because especially since uh, they've just taken the SATs, that life reminds me of my Princeton Review SAT class, my prep class, which was about eliminating the wrong answer to find the right one. To do everything, to do everything that comes your way, and slowly but surely, you'll get closer and closer and get more focused to what you want to do in life. And actually, that's the way our educational system is also designed. We start with very general subjects, right? Math. Then we get focused, algebra. Then we get focused, calculus. Then we quit math. Um, but it's the same, life is, <laughs> life is the, sorry, Mr. Barrow, my, my algebra teacher. Um, so uh, back to my path. So I started on uh, as a PA for my fair lady. Uh, that led to a PA production uh, assistant chip on uh, production Grease in the, in the 90s, uh, produced by the Weislers. Uh, I then stage managed for a little while. I worked for an agent for a little while in here. I was just saying yes to everything. Then I slipped into the side of the business known as company management. I company managed a non-union national tour of a grand night for singing that drove through every single state in nine weeks uh, with not us, me and 19 kids on a bus. Amazing. Uh, and then I worked uh, as an associate company manager on Showboat, I worked on Candide, Parade, the national tour of Jekyll and Hyde, Chicago, here in Las Vegas, um, where I developed my blackjack habit, and uh, also on the road, Cinderella, and then the Broadway companies of Thoroughly Modern Millie uh, and Gypsy. So this is where I cut my teeth as a company manager, learning all the ins and outs of the business. But what I really wanted to do was produce. Now in the mid-90s, uh, this guy, uh, Hal Prince, wrote a very famous article about how there were no more creative producers anymore. There were only check writers. And he longed for the days of the David Merrick and the people, the producers that would come up with ideas and bring teams together. So I, I, I read the article and I remember thinking, this is what I want to do. Now, I was lucky enough to work with Hal on three occasions. Um, and when I read the article, I was working on Candide at the time. And uh, I literally ran up to him during tech and handed him his coffee and then said, Hal, I read that article. This is exactly what I want to do. Can I talk to you about this? And he said, yes, of course, just not now. I'm teching act two. So <laughs> perhaps we can <laughs> talk about this at another time, Ken. You know, these stagehands are making $87,000 an hour right now. Um, so uh, he invited me to his office. He was so generous with, with uh, folks uh, like me at the time. And I took that opportunity to pitch him every single idea I had ever had for a musical, uh, including my, my favorite, which was Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, just a moment of remembrance for Mr. Wilder there. Um, 
which of course the show is finally happening right this year charlie and chocolate factory coming to broadway and i cannot wait i've been dreaming about this for 20 years now so i pitched him i said i wanted to do that i pitched him this other idea i had called mole people which was a musical about the people living in the subway tunnels in new york city probably the worst idea for a musical ever come up with but i pitched it hal liked it actually in a hal prince sweeney todd merrily kind of way um I actually, he wrote me a letter afterwards saying that um, my ideas for it were on the mark. And I know that quote um, by heart because I framed that letter and it hangs above my computer every day now to remind me that Hal Prince said I was on the way to something. Um, so I was pitching him all these big ideas, right? And Hal stopped me in the middle of like the 27th idea and said, Ken, Ken, do you remember the first show I ever produced? You know, Hal was a producer before he was a director. And I said, no. And he said, it was the pajama game. Don't come out of the box trying to produce West Side Story. Be happy if you get the pajama game. Ran a couple of years, made a lot of money, made a lot of people happy. And more importantly, Ken, it got me started. It led me to West Side Story. And those words rang so true for me as I went home that day. And see, I had had this little idea of this show that I wanted to do, but frankly, I put it away because I didn't think it was important enough. It wasn't Les Mis. I wanted to produce Les Mis. I wanted to change the world, right? To be a little sexist against my own sex is a very common thing, I think, for young men that come out of school. We're very cocky, we're full of ego, and we think we, can, we know everything and we can do everything, right? I was not ready to produce Charlie and the Chocolate Factory in my early 20s. There was no way I could have done that. So Hal told me to do anything, however small. So I pulled this idea back onto my desk, um, which was based on a show that I had heard about, hadn't even seen it at this point, called Tony and Tina's Wet. Right, an interactive show, but yes, Tony and Tina's. Um, and I had seen the success of the show and actually the thousand rip-offs of it. There was Joey and Maria's wedding, Grandma Sylvia's funeral, Bernie's bar mitzvah. They were everywhere. So the first thing, the business guy in me said, well, audience is really are like this type of entertainment. There's something about interactive uh, entertainment that they enjoy. And they all seem to take place at milestone events in people's lives. So I was like, I wonder what's a milestone event in my, the prom? It was a big moment for me, turning 18, you're graduating, what's gonna happen on prom night, all those things, right? But that didn't seem like enough. So I said, what if I set mine back in time? What if I set it at 1989, created the dream prom that I always wanted to go to when I was in high school? Uh, and what if I let my audience vote for prom king and queen, right? The, the American Idol craze was just starting to hit. And that all those ideas came together, those little different things, and became my very first show, The Awesome 80s Prom, which ran for 10 years. Yes, amazing. It actually, to, to my shock and surprise, is being done at high schools across the country now, um, which I love it, and they love it, which is also makes me feel very old, because they are not around when these movies that it was based on were created. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the prom. Because it sounds so simple, right? Oh, I sat down, I created a show. That's like a massive idea to me, even today, as I sit down and think about being a producer. Ken, you need to create a show, right? I can't think of it like that. And that's, that's not how I created the show. You wanna hear how I created it? The idea of, of building a show, producing a show, seems so scary to me that I actually pulled some of my own neuroses, I should say, uh, to create the show. So I'm a bit OCD, right? At the end of my day, my desk has to be entirely clean. There can't be anything on it. I knew that if there was something on my desk, I would have to do something with it. I also knew that I needed actors for this. One thing there is never a shortage of in New York City is actors. So I said, I know what I'll do. I'll post an audition for something I'll call the 80s prom project. And I'll get pictures and resumes and they'll sit on my desk. And they did, hundreds. Well, now I have to do something with those pictures and resumes. I sorted them into two piles. Ones I liked and ones that weren't quite right for this project. Now I have ones that I like. What do I do? I have to have an audition. I had an audition. What do I do? I have to call them back. What do I do? I have to cast them. Now I have a cast. I don't have a show at this point, mind you. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. No script. I don't even have the title. I have 80s prom project. But I was, I was just, I thought this idea might work. So 
I said, well, I've got a cast now. I guess I have to have a rehearsal. That's what you do. So I booked a studio at Ripley Greer Studios, 528th Avenue, right? Many of you, I'm sure, know it. And uh, for those of you who know it, you also know that there's a McDonald's like right around the corner. I swear to you, 30 minutes before the rehearsal started, I was at that McDonald's reading a book called How to Improv. I did not know what I was going to do in that room. But I followed these series of very small steps in order to get to that place to help me create that show. And that is my point here. That's how you accomplish anything in life. And sometimes these big concepts that we think about, these grand things, the changing the face of theater, bringing young people, to, it's so massive that it's hard for us to comprehend. For me, it's like running a marathon, right? Running a marathon to me is just this massive thing that I just scares me to death. And the thing about these big things, these running marathons, these giant themes, is that they scare so many people that they scare them into a state of paralysis and they just don't do them. The minority of the people out there actually run marathons. Majority don't, they're too scared of them. So if you want to do anything, and I don't care whether this is bring young people to the theater, change the face of theater, whether it's lose some weight, whether it's lower your golf handicap by five uh, strokes, this guy, um, it's about one step at a time. These series of small, easily actionable items, EAIs, I have this expression in my office, that slowly snowball into something bigger. Whereas I like to say, take a series of small steps to have big effects. That's where change comes from. I sit in so many meetings where we talk about these grand concepts and they just go round and round with these big, massive thoughts and ideas that don't go anywhere. Create a small series of steps like the same as like your to-do list, like going to the pick up the dry cleaning, like going grocery shopping. It's things that are easily executable. Do what Hal said for me to do. Do anything, something, no matter how small it is, right? Try to convince one minority kid who's never been in the theater to audition. Cast a classic role usually played by a man to be played by a woman. Have a contest in your class. Challenge every kid in the class to write a 10 minute play with a woman as a protagonist, right? Ask a child with a disability to write a short story, or better, if he says, I can't write, do this. I just challenged a whole bunch of readers on my blog to do this. You want a 30 days to a one-person show? Go home every night. This will work for all of you, by the way. Teachers have great stories. Go home for the next 30 days. Every single night, take out this. Put it on record and tell a story. One minute, two minute, however short, doesn't matter. Every day for 30 days. Tell this kid to do the same thing. At the end of 30 days, you'll have 30 stories. Get them transcribed. You will have an outline for a one-person show. That simple. It's these simple, and notice how I stepped through that. Take out your phone, record, one minute. Very simple, digestible things. I made this analogy last night when we were having dinner. I got served this massive steak, right? The thought about eating the whole steak at once, I can't do that. It's impossible, so I won't do it, or I'll get sick. I cut it up into little bite-sized elements. That's how you digest and that's how you accomplish things. Might sound like I'm wrapping up, but I am not. Uh, I want to get back to my path real quickly. After the awesome 80s prom, it led to my second show, Altar Boys. A cat yes! A Catholic boy band. Their names are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Juan. The fifth character, his name is Abraham. He's Jewish. Inclusion. Uh, led to my, led to my uh, third show, My First Time, a show I'm sure that's being done at high schools all over the place. Uh, it's my answer to the vagina long is about first sexual experiences, but there was another first with this. It was the first example of what I call theater 2.0. I actually optioned a website called myfirsttime.com that included, it was all about uh, first person accounts, real true stories of people's first sexual experiences. I adopted, uh, adapted all these into uh, play. Uh, four actors telling these stories, right? Um, after these three off-Broadway shows, I remember thinking, I gotta get back to Broadway. I'm a big, I wanna be a big Broadway producer, right? I wanna be like these guys. Well, not exactly like those guys. But I want my name on a door. I wanna be big and businessy. I wanna like walk around with all the other people in my uh, community, my peers, that, that I feel that they're so businessy. And, um, so I said I, I need to be very formal. I started wearing suits and ties every day. I started doing this thing. 
And then I said, I, well, if I'm a business, if I'm a proper business, I need a proper mission statement, right? That's what all businesses need. So I like imagined that I had gone to Harvard, right? And I said, okay, what would a Harvard-like MBA mission statement be? And I came up with this. Davenport Theatrical is the most cutting edge, technologically advanced production and development company, blah, 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 right? Uh, and why did I want that fancy corporate mission statement? Why did I want that? I wanted to fit in. I wanted to feel like all those other businesses out there. So the funny thing about that mission statement is we went on retreat. I took my staff members on retreat a few months later. And I had, I had taken that mission statement and I had made them print it out and I made them put it on their computers so where they could stare at it every day, somewhere on their desk so they could see it, so it could be ingrained in them, so they could really remember every day as they sat down, that's what we're gonna be the most kind of, yes, we're gonna uh, go at it, right? Really inspiring. So we got to this retreat and we played Davenport Theatrical Trivia where the winner got a massage at the spa or whatever it was. And I said, you know, when's my birthday? What was our first show? And then I said, who can tell me the name of the, or who can repeat the Davenport Theatrical Mission Statement? Not a single one of them could remember what it was. Not one. And they were looking at it every single day. And that's when I knew I had a problem. Right? So I went home and I said, okay, I have to change it. It's not unique enough. It's not special enough. It obviously isn't encompassing what we do because they can't even tell me what it is. And in fact, Remember how I said Davenport Theatrical, blah, blah, blah? I can't remember what it is. I can't. So I went home and I spent an entire night trying to come up with a new mission statement, and I did. And it's simply this. We do shit that other people don't. <laughs> That's it. In a nutshell, I did get permission to swear, by the way. I did ask in, in advance. Um, but we're in Vegas, right? Uh, this is it in a nutshell. And even if you think about some of the shows that I've talked about already, prom, remember I didn't green light it until I had set it back in time and the audience could vote. I separated it from Tony and Tina's. My first time, user generated content, theater 2.0. In fact, what I didn't tell you is we also put surveys on everyone's seat, had them fill out details about their own first sexual experiences. Where were they? How old were they? Did they use contraceptive? All these things. But what would they say to their partner if they were here right now? Ooh, that was a good one. Um, you're all thinking about this right now, I know. I'll give you a second to go back. OK, here we are. Um, so all of these things, though, were shit that other people weren't doing. So that's when I knew I was onto something. I took this mission statement straight to Broadway and made this color every single choice that I made for shows to do. One of the first Broadway shows I was a part of was a show called 13. Great show. All teen cast, all teen band. There wasn't an adult on stage. Never been done before. And then I started to play with doing unique things that other people hadn't do with the marketing of some of my shows. So for this, I, I actually still can't believe they let us do this. I remember saying, you know, uh, Broadway shows, uh, it is tradition that they have a invited dress rehearsal before the first paid public performance or a gypsy run where we invite the Broadway communities to come see what we've done. And I remember when the, when the typical, okay, when are we doing the gypsy because that's what everyone else does and that's how we fit into the Broadway community, I stopped everyone and I said, you know what, there is a group of people who should own this show, who should feel like it's theirs before the rest of the Broadway community and that's teenagers. 13 year olds can't actually own much so we should let them own this show. They'll, that ownership will make them market it more. So we uh, had the, an all teen invited dress rehearsal. We put the word out and gave free tickets to a thousand teenagers from 13 to 17 in the area, invited them in to see the show for free. Not an adult in the house. Literally parents dropped their kids off at the front door and we locked the doors behind them and told the parents to stay out. I, I, unfortunately, I don't think we'd get away with doing that today. I think there'd be uh, too much resistance, but we did it. And let me tell you, the lead producer of that show, Bob Boyette, came up to me and said, Ken, would you like to welcome all the kids to the, to the show? And I was like, are you crazy? Get one of the understudies to come out. And that's what happened. You know, um, actually, you can see her in the back. You know, all the way on the right in the green, you know who that is? It's Ariana Grande. Yeah, right over, oh, now, now, now. 
I, where's my laser? Anyway, in the green all the way on the right. Um, and when that one of the understudies came out and said, hey, everybody, welcome to the first all teen invited dress. Oh, thank you very much. Who's <laughs> in the back. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. There she is. Um, she likes attention, so she'll appreciate that. Don't tell her I said that. Uh, I just remember this being live streamed, I think. Uh, so, and when, when this understudy said, welcome to the first all teen invited dresser, the, the kids blew the roof off the joint. And I knew they felt like they owned it. Things that people weren't doing. I took that to Godspell, right? Something tells me you've seen this slide before. Um, the, I crowdfunded this. I asked investors, I had over 700 investors in this show who invested as little as $1,000 never been done before on Broadway. We used the internet to do it. Typical Broadway shows, $25,000 is the minimum you can get in, not this one. And the reason why I did that is because, again, Stephen Schwartz said to me, Godspell is about a community of people coming together. And I said, what if I could develop the largest community of producers, investors ever? That's what we did. Front page article of the New York Times, just based on crowdfunding. My next, um, this is one of my favorite productions. It's One Man uh, Macbeth with Alan Cumming. Talk about doing shit that other people don't. When CAA called me and said, Ken, would you like to produce, would you be interested in talking to Alan Cumming about producing with One Man Macbeth, I literally said, how many other producers have you called before you got to me? Because I'll be very honest, I know I'm not, you know, the top of CAA's call list. There are like five other producers, Scott Rudin, Kevin McCall, like all these guys that they'll go to first, right? That actually interested me when I heard that a whole bunch of other people had turned it down. Literally, other people were not doing it. So I said, ooh, maybe I should. And I, I told the agent that day, I said, tell me, this is Macbeth, like set in Scotland? And he was like, no, no, no. Because I said, because if you're bringing me a traditional Macbeth, I don't want to have anything to do with it. I said, no, this is Alan Cummings, one man Macbeth. He plays all the roles. Macbeth, Lady Macbeth, he literally has sex with himself on stage. And it was quite something to see. And uh, it was an hour and 40 minutes. Shakespeare in an hour and 40 minutes, this guy, right? Um, I love that because um, for me, this is what today's audience wanted. Also, I called it Macbeth SVU because it was set in a mental institution where this man had obviously just been, had just committed some grave crime, things that other people hadn't done. Daddy Long Legs may seem like a traditional show. Two people, sweet, beautiful score by Paul Gordon, directed by John Kerr, who just won a Drama Desk Award. Seems totally traditional. That's why I live streamed it. We live streamed this. Over 150,000 people from all over the world tuned in. Someone you tuned in? Uh, 135 countries tuned in to watch this. Other people weren't doing it, so I did it. And then, of course, one of the most uh, things in my life I'm most proud of is Death West Spring Awakening. <clears throat> a cast of hearing and deaf performers on stage. I feel like I have to mention our interpreter right now. Thank you for being here. Um, thank you. As, uh, as well as the first ever woman in a wheelchair on Broadway. And yeah, I have to tell you, when we, when, when we started talking about this at an ad meeting, we were, I remember being like, has there ever been someone in a wheelchair on Broadway before? And someone actually said, well, FDR and Annie. And I was like, no, 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 not, no, that's not the point. And then, we, we did some realize uh, some research and realized that Ali was the first woman in a wheelchair, first person in a wheelchair ever on Broadway. And doing this show, doing shit that other people weren't doing, got us enormous amounts of press. More press than I've ever seen any Broadway show ever get. Now this strategy of developing shows and picking shows that are different from all others, uh, to, to use a Jewish expression, right? What makes this show different from all others? I use that when I, when I decide what shows I'm gonna do. I took this to my other pursuits as well. I blog, as many of you know. I'm the only Broadway producer that blogs. I have a podcast. I did develop a, a board game called Be a Broadway Star. Why did I develop this? Because there wasn't one. I swear, that's why I did it. Um, my girlfriend at the time, now wife, 
uh, came home from a party one night and I said, what'd you do? She said, we played apples to apples. And I remember thinking, what is this group of 20 somethings theater people doing playing apples to apples? They should be playing a theater game. Why aren't they? Oh wait, there isn't one. Oh wait, I'll do one. And to digress a little bit and go back to how I accomplished uh, the prom, I didn't know how to create a board game. I didn't know how to do this. You know what my first step was? Google how to make board game. I swear. There, and they laid out some steps for me. Make a prototype, do this, what game is it similar to, like all this stuff. And the next thing you know, we were playing a sample in my office. And now it's one of the top sellers on Amazon.com, theater-related gifts every year, right? And it goes on and on. And the reason why this stuff works, the reason why this is a top seller, is because what hasn't been done is instantly in demand. Instantly. I often think, frankly, that consumers are like babies. And I don't mean that in a, in a negative way at all. You, you've all seen a baby, right? And what I love about watching kids is when they have, they, you know that they're seeing something they've never seen before, their eyes just go like, what the heck is that? They kind of do this. This is what consumers do when they experience something that they haven't experienced before. And look, this theory is, runs rampant through all of Broadway shows. Rent. Here's a, here's a musical debuted in the 90s that was about AIDS and drag queens and a bunch of slackers living on the Lower East Side that didn't want to pay uh, their rent, right? Not typical Broadway fair in 1996. No, but it was stuff that other people weren't doing. What about this one? Avenue Q, puppets having sex on stage. Puppets in a Broadway musical, period. They beat Wicked for the Tony Award. Book of Mormon. First time the C word was ever mentioned in a Broadway musical. But yeah, cheers. <laughs> oh, your president said that. That's my favorite part. Literally, when I saw this one night, I, I left and I heard a, um, an audience go behind me say, I've never seen or heard anything like that on a Broadway stage before. And of course, the ultimate example of doing something different, things that haven't been done before, of course, is Hamilton, right? People never e even thought Broadway could do something like that. I, I always like to think of if uh, they tried to sell Hamilton as a movie first. Can you imagine that Hollywood pitch meeting? Like, okay, so it's about Alexander Hamilton. Nope. And then <laughs> we're going to tell it through rap. Are you kidding? And there's not a white face in the Founding Fathers. No way it would have made it out of that room. Which, by the way, is why I'm in the theater and not in Hollywood. And what I love about the theater, we are a non-realistic art form. We should, we should applaud and incorporate this stuff because we're better off when we do. Now, obviously, all the shows I just mentioned were great shows. But what really helped them cut through the clutter was that they were uniquely great. There was nothing like them ever before on Broadway. And this theory, again, is not just about theater. This is a standard business axiom. This is where the commercial theater producer in me takes over, right? I try to look at what big business does. The Prius. First mass-produced hybrid vehicle. It was unique. It hadn't been done before. Netflix. Do you remember when everyone was saying that releasing all the episodes of House of Cards at once would destroy Netflix? Why would people go back? You have to follow the old television model of serving it up slowly. No. You probably all watch Netflix more than you watch regular television nowadays, right? And the ultimate example of doing making unique products and unique marketing, Apple. You remember the fur I remember my first iPhone and it coming in that box? The packaging was so unique. The technology, everything about it was so unique and so special. So we now know, I've just stepped you through a whole bunch of examples, both theatrical and not, that proves that doing different things is a path to success much more than doing the same old thing. So the question always is, why are we so afraid of it? It's not as risky as we think. It's not like gambling. Unique is actually what works. It, what make businesses stand out and what makes them a success. It's actually why business schools teach business developers to come up with what they call a USP. Do you know what this is? USP stands for unique selling proposition. Why is your business different from all others? 
And that's because the truth is in all industries, doing stuff that hasn't been done before is great business. Now this is why it's such an exciting time to be in this room and working in the theater today. Because diversity, inclusion, accessibility, all this stuff, we often talk about it because it's the right thing to do, right? This is the right, let's make it accessible to all. This is what's right. The great thing is it's not only what's right, it's the smart thing to do from a business perspective because all these things haven't been done to the volume that they could be. You can pay $100,000 and get a full page ad of the New York Times to advertise a Broadway show. Or you can do what I try to do is get a feature article in the New York Times that costs me zero from doing something different, from convincing your people, your higher ups, all, everyone out there to not be afraid of it. Doing something different will actually draw more attention to what you're doing. And when you have more attention, when you have more press, you know what comes with it? Money. Money. So my advice to you, don't fit in. I encourage you all to, in your breakout sessions today, in your workshop sessions, come up with one, just one, one very small laundry list-like item that you can do today that could start a revolution tomorrow. Look, there are hundreds of people in this room. We had a hundred contests challenging a class to write a 10 minute play with a woman as a protagonist. Imagine what that little butterfly flapping his wings could cause around the rest of the world. These small things matter and they actually are much easier to accomplish than the bigger ones. So steal my mission. Do shit that other people don't. Because if all of us are doing this stuff that other people aren't doing, we, it actually becomes this very cool feedback loop where we're challenging our stuff, ourselves to better what we do, to do different things, unique things. And it makes the theater a better place, and more importantly, it makes the world a better place. I want to thank you for having me. And also, I have to say this. I want to thank you all for doing what you do. The f you are the future of the theater. There's no doubt about it. And after meeting so many of you last night in elevators, uh, I... I'm so happy <laughs> that the future of the theater is in your hands. So thank you so much for having me today. It's early, Sid, please, thank you. We, we have time for uh, about 10 minutes of uh, Q&A with, with Ken. I'm sure none of you have any questions, so. No, just kidding. So, uh, questions, uh, I'm working this side, and uh, people work on that side. Questions? So out of curiosity, when you talked about you bringing this group in and you didn't know what you were going to do with them to create your 80s prom thing, what did you end up doing with them? I picked out like my three favorite improvisational exercises from that book, and I did that. The first thing I did was sat down. We do The first one is like you go around the room, tell me about yourself. The great thing about that, that'll take you know two hours right there when you're talking to actors. <laughs> Um, we did that, then we talked about, I asked them a bunch of questions, tell me about your prom, tell me about your high school experience, where'd you fit in? My favorite, when you ask that to theater people, like were you a jock, were you a cheerleader, were you what, were you popular, whatever, they're always like, I'm a floater. That was my, that's a common response I get from theater people, which makes sense, they go from one click to another. Um, so we, we did that. Now that strategy has become a bit of my own trademark of developing shows. I've used that now on four different projects. Uh, Getting the Band Back Together was a Broadway-bound musical. We debuted at the George Street Playhouse. The idea for that was a 40-year-old man loses his job in the financial crisis, has to move back in with his mom in New Jersey, runs into his best friend, uh, who he hasn't seen in 20 years, who says, dude, you're back in town. You know what we should do? We should put the band back together. A group of 40-year-old guys reassemble their high school garage band, right? That's all I had. I cast who I thought those people would be. I put them in a room and I said, let's write a musical. And I typed down everything they said, we improv. So I've done that a lot. I often wonder how people like Hunter can write musicals all by themselves. Um, it's incre these incredibly gifted people that can do that. I need the help of about 20 people. 
So when you have the idea and you have the passion and everything that goes with it, how do you get the idea or how do you get in front of the right people to make the funding happen? You get, well, the right people is staring at you in the mirror every morning, first of all. I mean, you have to think about it like, like that. Whatever idea you have, whether it's I'm going to write a screenplay, whether it's I'm going to create a new app. You know, I, I talk to so many people that I have this great idea for a new app. And then I say, well, what are you doing about it? Well, I don't know. I don't know how to create an app. Well, that means you need to get someone to help you create that app. Anyone have an idea for an app in this room? Yeah, you got one? Great. A couple in the back? Ever done anything with it? Great. You, you have, uh, we're going to do this right now. So there's a great website called Upwork. Okay, anyone know it? Upwork or guru.com, which is a connecting freelancers from all over the world. You can get anything here from transcribers. Remember I talked about one person shows, like all those recordings. Send those recordings to someone for a very small amount of money. They will send them back the transcriptions and you don't have to do it. The other thing that these sites are filled with, app developers. For free, you could go tonight, sign on to Upwork and post something Here's the app I would like. It does this, it does this, it does this. Click. People will bid to build that app for you. All that you gotta do is describe it. Now what this process is something else, I, and I coach a lot of entrepreneurs and a lot of business folk, uh, people or, and people with ideas, and the, uh, the analogy I use here is that entrepreneurs, artists, you yourself, what your responsibility is is serving the tennis ball. You start the game. Bam and you wait for someone to hit it back to you, and then you hit it back to them. Posting that on Upwork tonight is you serving the tennis ball. And I got good news for you. Hundreds of people from around the world will hit that tennis ball back to you for less than you think. And then you have to decide, well, I got 10 responses. I'm gonna pick which are my favorites. And then you're gonna find, oh, there's my favorite. Now it's gonna cost X. How am I gonna get that money, right? And then raising the money, I know. Now I could talk for hours about raising the money. Uh, the, the, the quick answer to this is that People invest in people, not in projects. And you know how I know this? There are thousands of really bad movies, books, plays, products. Have you ever come out of a movie and go, how the F did that get made? Right, Ishtar? Like, this stuff is horrible. Like, the, like these, that's a dated reference right there. But um, products that are like, who made this crap? Somebody with serious amounts of passion said, this is gonna be the next big thing. And because they were so passionate, they got people to do it. There's a lot of steps, of course, to come with that. But really, it's about people. And it's about going to the people closest to you that want to invest in you, personal. And you'll find them. You'll find them. In the front here? Oh, he's got a move there. Um, I'm curious if there's a Spring Awakening effect or Hamilton effect in the pipeline on Broadway in the industry now where other producers and creators are going, well, that worked, and you see more of, of that inclusion ahead. Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, it's happening, I believe, it's all over, which is fantastic. Uh, and I'm not going to say that Spring Awakening started it, but certainly um, it was a lightning rod for the conversation. Um, there's a production of Hunchback, I believe, that cast a deaf actor. Uh, the production of uh, Glass Menagerie that's coming to Broadway. Amanda has a disability. Like there, there's um, a number of these things popping up. And more importantly, it's about just starting the conversation. It's about asking, because never before have we thought, oh, should we look about, should we think about this? Yes, yes we should. I got called out for it uh, by Lynn Ahrens. Lynn Ahrens did my podcast. And we were, I was talking to her about the challenges of being a woman. And, if she, and she was like, well, Ken, let me ask you, what's the ratio of men to women on your podcast? And I was like, uh, I don't know. And we went away afterwards and I discovered it was skewed a little bit more men than women. So now Lynn got me to, before I make more invitations, I just think about it another second. Hey, can I think about it? Can I try to even up the playing field here just a little bit? And that thought process, that's what great art does. My high school English teacher, Miss Sang, she once had this um, definitions of art on the board what art was. That appealed to me the most was that art is meant to disturb. And it doesn't mean disturb in a scary, bad way. It just means knock you off a little bit. Just make you think. 
And that's what I think great art and great theater does. And Spring Awakening certainly made a lot of people think. Uh, well, thank you for being here. Um, as an educator in Mississippi, I find myself oftentimes sitting across a desk from an administrator or school board that is just so stuck in this idea of tradition. And so uh, in Mississippi, you're, we're not going to get to do Spring Awakening. We're not going to get to do shows that are pushing the envelope or that are unique. You know, and oftentimes we're just following a formula. So what are some ways you think that I could you know, enlighten these individuals who fall, you know, trapped within their, you know, religious beliefs or their, their, um, I guess, you know, belittled ideas of what the world is because they never really leave their county. So, I mean, how, how, you know, how can I, uh, I guess, combat that? Well, the thing is, you will be able to do Spring Awakening. It just probably won't be for a while. I mean, that's the thing. It is changing no matter what they want or say down there. It's changing. Um, it just is a little slower, and there's nothing wrong with that. This, what's amazing about this country is that we're so incredibly different in our thoughts. I'm, I'm amazed sometimes we're actually one country when you think about the different, different beliefs, right? Um, so, and it's incredible that we've been able to, to keep actually this together and what makes us very special, of course. Um, it's about, it's going to take, look, my high school, they wouldn't let us do Greece. They've done Greece since. And the same is true. We never would have thought about doing rent, and now rent is done all over. They will get there. So the thing for you is don't go home. Again, it's the, spring awakening is your big, like, that's the big thing. Put it away for now. Put it to the side for now. Think about something much smaller that you can get them to do. E, just simpler that they can digest now. These series of small steps that you take will lead them to Spring Awakening. The next thing you know, they'll be standing on their feet at Spring Awakening, not even realize how it got there. We have time for one more question. This might be a bigger question to answer than in our few minutes, but in the digital age that we're living in with these kids that are, are growing up to not know a world without internet and without their social media at their fingertips, how is that affecting what you think the future landscape is uh, for live theater, uh, this idea of doing shit that other people don't when they're demanding us to do things that we haven't done before. So how is that affecting your perspective on things? Yeah, this is the thing I'm actually mo most excited about. And it has also to do with the phone. But even what I think is going to happen sooner is that, you know, I was, um, I'm also part of the Atari generation. Yeah. Pong, anyone? Um, so uh, I'm, we're part of, those of us who just cheered, we're all part of the home video game generation, right? The next generation after that, they've not known life without video games or without these things in their pockets, right? This is what they do. Part of a serious chunk of their entertainment, it's not just boys, by the way, it's not just men. A lot of women, a lot of young girls play video games, huge percentage. Their entertainment is something where they control the outcome of their hero. They participate. So if we think that this generation is going to want to sit in front of shows and watch fourth wall plays, we're sadly mistaken. They're going to want things where they are feel like their fingers are on a joystick somewhat. And not only are they going to want it, they're going to create it. Because they're, of course, not only the next generation of theater goers, they're the next generation of theater makers. So I would expect the video game generation to start demanding, and we're seeing it already. We're seeing an increase in immersive theater experiences. Um, there's a great, uh, anyone from Chicago, there was a great thing I saw there called The Last Defender, which was like half video game, half escape. It was amazing. Um, I'm actually looking to see if I can get that to New York. Um, but we'll see that. The other, the other uh, big change, I think, and I, I'm so excited about this one, uh, because it's um, one of the biggest problems I have today is uh, getting a theater on Broadway, right? There's only 40 of them, 41 they'll be in the spring. And that means a whole bunch of shows can't come to Broadway, no matter how good they are. The theater owners are like the St. Peter's of Broadway. They decide who gets in and who doesn't. And they make their choices, choices and no one really knows how it happens. It's like a Google algorithm. It's some crazy thing that we don't know. It has a lot to do with celebrities. Uh, and those choices happen. Well, the next generation of 
theatrical creators are the people that were born with these phones in their pockets and also part of the DIY generation, right? They could do anything they want at any point. They can Google and know how to do anything. They want to make a movie, they can do it on a phone in their pocket and it can play in theaters all over the country. What's going to happen, I believe, is that one of these new generation thinkers and creators is going to go to one of these Broadway theater owners and say, I'd like a, I'd like a theater for my latest show. Here's what it is. And they're going to say, I'm sorry, there's no room at the inn for you. And that's not going to make sense. The, the, the creator is going to be like, what are you talking about? I can create anything I want and put it out there in the world. That's what I've been doing. I've been putting it on YouTube. I've been doing this stuff. I'd like a theater. No, I'm sorry. We don't have it. And that generation isn't going to make, it's not going to make sense for them. They don't know the word gatekeeper because they can do anything. And what they're going to do is they're going to go, I'm going to do it myself then. And they're going to find some other place in and around New York City. And the content is going to be so good and so amazing that people are going to start going, especially because as that generation gets older, again, the creators and the audience have the same sensibilities. So the audience is going to start to go, yeah, I want us to go see that. And the walls of Broadway are slowly going to start crumbling. And the circle, the Broadway box that we call it, I guess it's a box, will slowly start expanding and expanding and include different venues, different areas, different types of theater all over the city and I think all over the country. Thank you again so much for having me. I appreciate it.